Namaste and greetings. I, Ritika Sundar, a researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Ivam Nidhi Anusandhan Sansthan, Nadali, warmly welcome you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a distinguished lecture on the topic, Recent Developments in West Asia, Challenges for Indian Diplomacy by Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. This talk is a part of the series, The State of International Affairs, Hashtag Diplomacy Dialogue, which is organized by IMPRI, Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies. Today, I deem it my honor to introduce the speaker. Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed served as an Indian ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UAE. He was additional secretary for international cooperation in the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas between 2004 and 2006, and director general of the Indian Council of World Affairs, New Delhi, between 2006 and 7. Following retirement from foreign service in 2011 and a four-year stint in the corporate sector in Dubai, he is now a full-time academic and holds the Ram Sati Chair for International Studies at Symbiosis International University in Pune. He writes regularly on issues relating to political Islam, the politics of West Asia, Eurasia, and the Indian Ocean, and energy security. Welcome, sir. We're fortunate to have a distinguished discussant for today's deliberation. Welcome, sir. Professor A.K. Pasha teaches at the Center for West Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, where he has served as chairperson and is now director of Gulf Studies. He has also been director of the Maulana Azad Center for Indian Culture in Cairo, Egypt. He has authored, edited, and co-edited, as well as contributed chapters to over 60 books published in India and in the Gulf, West Asia and North Africa. His research articles have been published in numerous national and international journals. After graduating from St. Philonema's College in Mysore, he obtained MA degrees in Middle Eastern Studies and Political Science from Mysore University, MPhil and PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has previously taught at the Center for West Asian Studies, Aligarh Muslim University in India. He had been a research fellow at the Faculty of Economics and Political Science in Cairo University in Egypt. He's associated with Gulf Research Center in Dubai, UAE. His research, teaching, and writing focused on West Asia and North Africa. He is on the editorial board of several national and international journals. He's a frequent commentator and analyst on international affairs, especially on West Asian and North African issues for radio and TV in India and abroad. We look forward to learning from a distinguished speaker and eminent panelist, and we look forward to an enriching deliberation. With that, I invite Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director, IMPRI, New Delhi, and the moderator for today's session to take over. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome. Uh, thank you, Ritika, for leading us into the discussion today. Uh, the West Asian region, as some of us know, has for long been the locus of waves of volatility and instability. Countries there have actually withered a lot. They have withered uh, autocratic regimes to springs and aspirations of democratic systems, international sanctions to civil wars, extremism, sectarianism, and violence of incredible proportions. So what are the socio-political, economic, and strategic trends that are unfolding in West Asia? How do these impact India, given that India considers West Asia as its extended neighborhood? What are the best options for India to enhance the existing relations with West Asian region in a much more frequent and a meaningful manner? So to discuss all these and beyond, our uh, distinguished speaker, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed will take us through. And our distinguished um, discussant, Professor A.K. Pasha would take us through. So thank you so much and I welcome you. I also welcome all our participants. Without any further ado, I would invite Ambassador Ahmed for his lecture. Sir, it's all yours, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mehta. Uh, in the short time that we have with us, uh, I will uh, 
not give details of what is happening, but just indicate the main points. When we look at West Asia today, uh, just over six months after President Biden has been in the White House, we uh, note that we are still, we uh, who are observers of West Asia and those who live in West Asia are still recovering from the trauma of the presidency that just went earlier, the Trump presidency. Very rarely has a president does so much damage to one particular region with his ill thought out and impetuous actions. But he is actually speaking in a long line of extremely destructive interventions that the Americans have perpetrated in this region. A massive assault upon Afghanistan after 9-11 uh, uh, with no planning as to what would happen the day after the Taliban regime had been ended. And that began a 20-year presence for the Americans, loss of a few thousand troops, but the actual killing of several thousand, several hundred thousand Afghans, and with so much money being spent in that country, nothing to show in terms of what they achieved. Similarly, they assaulted Iraq. It is still unclear as to what the presidential purpose was. We know that he was under tremendous pressure from the neocons, the extreme right-wing pro-Israel lobby in the country that had been extremely anxious for war against Iraq. And yes, the war did happen. Massive destruction occurred. 400,000 Iraqis were killed. And yet the Americans never realized, what are we doing here? So this kind of extremely ill-thought-out, peremptory, intervention, usually military intervention, have marked the American presence in that country. But with Donald Trump, you have the extraordinary, uh, you recall, a very robust intervention in order to expand the fault lines in the country as actively as possible. He was emotionally involved, and I would add financially involved with Saudi Arabia and was fostering a relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran and, and, uh, and Israel, and was viscerally hostile to the Iranians and peremptorily withdrew the United States from the agreement. Of course, now when you look at the United States, the legacy is very clear. United States is a significantly diminished presence in the global world order. And as of now, it appears that the president would like to disengage from West Asia. Again here, President Biden is in the long tradition of earlier U.S. presidents who usually begin their presidency with wanting to have nothing to do with West Asia, and then they find that they get involved more and more deeply as the months and years pass by with very little, in a very little ability to do anything useful or constructive. We are at the early stage. But what has happened is that the region seems to have read the American policy quite well. After the serious damage that was wreaked upon the region by, uh, by Donald Trump, not only by his actions, but also by his omission, the region has started uh, thinking about ways in which they can pursue their interests without the involvement of the Americans. As we speak about the disengagement of the Americans, we must also note that over the last few years, very quietly, but very significantly, two major role players have emerged in the region as well, and they are Russia and China. And they have today expanded uh, their presence and I, have, I would say to you that they are looking at reworking the global order over a period of time that would enmesh uh, all of Eurasia. So there is this presence. And the third point is the various conflicts that have occurred and the interventions that have taken place. If you were to now look at the map of West Asia, North Africa, you would have to admit that this region's security, its security landscape is integrated. 
you do not have any longer that tripartite division of the Gulf, West Asia, and North Africa. Gulf countries are involved in West Asia. In the case of the Syrian conflict, uh, you have Iran as well as Saudi Arabia intervening in Syria. You have UAE and Egypt intervening in Libya. You have both UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia as also Qatar deeply involved with Afghanistan. So you have a situation where the security landscape is connected. In this background, what has been happening recently? Let us go very quickly and note the points as we go along. Just as the uh, Biden presidency was beginning its, uh, its term, uh, Saudi Arabia rapidly ended the, uh, the siege of Qatar. You have, this had been in place from 2017. It had been largely encouraged by the total support given to Saudi Arabia by Donald Trump. And uh, Saudi Arabia, allied with the UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt, had thought it a golden opportunity to put pressure upon their, uh, their small neighbor and to get it to mend its ways. At that time, obviously, Qatar had come into their bad book because it was talking about ending the confrontation with Iran, bringing uh, Iran into the regional uh, uh, you know, space as also uh, this hostility against Muslim Brotherhood. It was opposed to it was opposed to that. Obviously, that uh, uh, siege did not work because instead of putting pressure upon the Qataris, uh, both Iran and Turkey rapidly came to the assistance uh, of Qatar, uh, as also the fact that Oman and uh, Kuwait were not involved with the siege. The siege was, at the end of the day, quite meaningless. But as the presidency of Biden emerged, uh, Saudi Arabia felt that this, uh, this uh, hopeless business should end and they withdrew from the, uh, from the siege. The UAE has also formally withdrawn, but it still exhibits a certain degree of unhappiness because the siege was ended without Qatar actually indicating any change in regard to its regional approach or its ideological affinity with the Brotherhood. There is another news that has come to us that from April onwards, we, there have been uh, secret con conversations between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we know that certain meetings have taken place in Baghdad. We are also told that meetings have taken place in Oman. Uh, there have been hints that they could be discussing uh, the way forward in Yemen and the restoration of diplomatic ties. Uh, we do, not much seems to have happened so far. My own impression is that the two countries were possibly waiting to see how, what would be the attitude of the Biden administration to the two of them. And I think the message is now quite loud and clear. As far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, Biden can't bear the sight of the crown prince and want to have nothing to do with him. It's a rather emotional approach. Uh, you know, it is as emotional as that of Donald Trump but in the opposite direction. And he has made it very clear that uh, he is going to scrutinize Saudi Arabia's human rights record. He wants to end the war in Yemen. He could even deny Saudi Arabia certain weaponry, and he doesn't want to talk to the crown prince at all. From the Iranian side, we had the impression, indeed uh, Biden had given us this impression, that as soon as he comes into the White House, he is going to rejoin the nuclear agreement. But that has not happened. The reality check has already occurred. As he came into the White House, he realized he just has four years to go and he wants to focus on his domestic agenda first. And for that, he needs a degree of national consensus in a country that is so deeply polarized. And therefore, he put Iran on the back burner and focused on the relief to be given for the in, for, in order to combat the pandemic. And then he started focusing on the infrastructure bill at home. He has said, and many of his officials have said, that their priority is China and the handling of relations uh, with the allies 
and that if the Middle East or West Asia, as we call it here, is not a priority for the Biden administration. Well and good. But West Asia has the habit of biting you when you least expect it, and therefore you had the violence in Gaza and in East Jerusalem. The Americans had to get into it. They had no choice. But really, they, they conducted themselves exactly as they do, do, did earlier, and that was to give the Israelis a very long rope, allow them to wreak as much violence as was possible on the Palestinians, both their own citizens as well as in Gaza. And after more than 200 people had been killed, a certain ceasefire was engineered, not by the Americans, but by the Egyptians with the help of the Qataris. So we have yet to see which way they are likely to go. Uh, but there has been something even more interesting that happened uh, as Trump was going into the election, uh, uh, as he was going into the election. In the month of August last year, UAE suddenly and dramatically announced that it was normalizing diplomatic ties with Israel. And soon thereafter, over the next three and few weeks, uh, Bahrain, uh, Sudan, and Morocco are also said to have uh, also said to have joined. We don't know. More, uh, Sudan has been a bit half-hearted. They got uh, they were uh, allured uh, with the prospect of getting out of the terrorism list that the Americans had made. The Americans abruptly removed them uh, uh, because they needed something else from them, and uh, they also gave a billion dollars in economic assistance. As far as Morocco is concerned, the Americans attempted to win them over uh, in support of their agenda by, by saying that they recognize Western Sahara as an integral part of Morocco. None of this has been done by the American presidents earlier, and this is in line with Trump's activities as far as Israel is concerned, recognizing things that don't belong to him and are not under US jurisdiction. But this is the way they have done. My own assessment has been and remains that it was done, this normalization was done specifically in the context of the elections in order to boost the prospects of Donald Trump. And at the same time, to boost the electoral prospects of Netanyahu as well, who then looked pretty ugly because he was facing all these, uh, uh, all these cases in court because of corruption, fraud, and misconduct, et cetera. So a normalization has occurred, even as the embassy has opened in the two countries concerned, uh, as far as UAE concerned, it is still in Tel Aviv. But Saudi Arabia, there was a tremendous pressure uh, imposed upon Saudi Arabia to come on board, but the kingdom obviously has a much larger constituency as compared to these other countries and could not pluck up the courage to, to commit this gross travesty in the region. So normalization has occurred. People say that this normalization is only bringing into the public space what was already happening behind the scenes as far as UAE is concerned and possibly even Saudi Arabia. And uh, it is part of the UAE uh, wanting to build ties with the Israel lobby in the United States, look good in the US, regardless of who is in the White House and because of the lobby that is there and to have some lucrative trade engagements and uh, technology cooperation arrangements as well. But something more interesting has happened as far as Israel is concerned. Even as Netanyahu thought that he would be prime minister for life, he was abruptly removed from this position and a government, a new government has come in. This government has got right-wing elements in the shape of the Prime Minister, Bennett Naftali, but it also has, has centrist and leftist elements, and it is supported by the Arab uh, list uh, in the Knesset as well. It's a unique development. After several years, indeed a few decades, you have this arrangement because otherwise Israeli politics has been dominated by the right wing. Today, this, this government has several firsts after a long time. It's the first government without Netanyahu in more than 12 years. It is the first government 
that does not have religious parties uh, in the coalition. As you know, the Israel's religious parties are extremely aggressive, extremely demanding, and indeed provide the ballast for the hostility and violence perpetrated by that country against the Palestinians. The third is that it is backed by the Arab list. We agree that we know that this is a shaky coalition, but they are all making an effort to keep the government going. And if that is indeed the case and it consolidates itself, my own sense is that regardless of the context in which normalization took place, there could be some prospect of change in the Israeli attitude in not months to come, but certainly a few years. You, can, you have to accept the fact that while Israel by law is a Jewish state that privileges one particular community over the other, it is also a democratic state and it has a 20% Arab community that are its citizens. And also you have to come up with policies which would enable you to address the needs and concerns of those millions of people in the occupied territories. So you could have. I don't want to be overly optimistic at this early stage, nor have I got too many hints from Tel Aviv just yet, but I would like to believe that at some stage there could be a new attitude. This would reflect the, uh, a new generation of Israelis. There is a new generation of uh, American Jews who are less enamored of the right-wing politics of Israel. And indeed, I have read very distinguished people saying that time has now come for Israel to give up the Zionist project with which it has been impelled for so long and become a normal state a normal state that would uh, that would accommodate different people with uh, who have citizen uh, who have its citizenship and also work with uh, the peace process uh, this kind of xenophobia that has impelled israel up to now could become diluted largely under the pressure of these new people who have come i also have a stray thought and this thought is that the Israelis in, throughout their existence have been taught to despise the Arab, to hate the Arab and to despise the Arab. It's a very racist connotation. But as they engage with the Arab, you know that in the last few months, 200,000 Israelis have actually visited the UAE as tourists and as businessmen. Over a period of time, as the Israelis deal with normal Arabs, Arabs who are well-educated, Arabs who are professionally qualified, Arabs who are affluent, who live in cities that are better than many American cities and uh, European cities in terms of infrastructure, they could realize that this Arab is not a demon and that there is a possibility of a balanced engagement with the Arab so that over a period of time, you could ease the relationship in, with the people in the occupied territories and see how you can learn to live together with each other. Another interesting thing that has happened in the last few months is that Turkey, which had such an aggressive posture in the region, has opened dialogue both with Egypt and with Saudi Arabia. Turkey is a complex presence in the region. Initially, it started as wanting to have zero problems. Then it, its problems continued to mount as it got involved with regional politics. To, uh, and then, of course, it got more uh, further involved uh, because of the problems it had with the Kurds. So now it has a military uh, uh, presence in both uh, Iraq and in Syria because it is combating uh, the aspirations of the Kurdish people. But it has also done another thing. It has reached across the Mediterranean into Libya and on the basis of its Muslim Brotherhood affiliation has worked with the government in Tripoli to obtain a maritime agreement that would extend its claims in the East Mediterranean. This has put Turkey in conflict with Greece and Cyprus, European country, European Union countries, 
and has created a degree of tension in the region. Are we now looking at the possibility of Turkey revising its approach to the region, becoming a little more accommodative, working with countries like Egypt and with Saudi Arabia? Neither so far. The meetings have already taken place, high profile meetings, but neither Egypt nor Saudi Arabia have yet shown enthusiasm. The main reason is that Turkey is still affiliated with political Islam and its politics is run on the basis of support for the ideology and ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood, both of which, which are anathema as far as Cairo and uh, Riyadh are concerned. But at least the dialogue has occurred. We don't see much change as far as its policies in, Iraq, in Syria and Iraq are concerned. But I have simply to flag the point that there is the hint of a change which may go forward. Egypt has been in the doghouse for very long, ever since it had conducted the, uh, uh, the coup d'etat against uh, Morsi uh, and had a breakdown in its economy. It had been crucially dependent on Saudi Arabia as well as on the UAE, now seems to be asserting itself and claiming a place in the major developments in the region. Uh, it, has, it played a significant role in bringing about a ceasefire in Gaza, for instance. So that is a very important point. And it has given a certain profile to Field Marshal Sisi that he did not have before. Also, uh, Turkey has reached out to him, well and good. You also see that he had gone to Baghdad and Egypt, Iraq, and Jordan have announced a new partnership of these three countries. If you look at the map, they are near contiguous. They bring a lot of strength to the table uh, between themselves. Uh, they have assets. And they are putting together a paradigm of cooperation outside any American involvement and outside any Gulf involvement. Each of them, for different reasons, wants to pursue an independent foreign policy that is not beholden either to big powers uh, like the Americans or to the Gulf powers. And I think this is a fascinating development. They have called their initiative the creation of a new love on, of uh, the region, a new uh, opening in the region. But Egypt has also become active in African affairs. Uh, it has a problem uh, with Ethiopia on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Uh, and because of that, it has very actively reached out to set up defense and economic agreements with various countries that surround Ethiopia. Till now, Egypt's interest used to be in West Asia rather than in Africa. And this is a significant change. And therefore, you will see over a period of time that it will not get its old place back because Saudi Arabia is already there as a rival. But having said this, over a period of time, it will start building together a certain space for itself and a certain degree of respect will be extended to its leader. Here you will see the role or that Egypt has played in Libya. There have been a lot of pressures upon Libya to use its armed forces. But Egypt is very clear that though they are headed by a military officer, they don't want to involve their armed forces in any action, unlike Turkey. All the initiatives that the Egyptians have taken have been diplomatic in character. And it is their diplomats, very seasoned and well-respected diplomats, they are the ones serving Egyptian interests rather than the armed forces. And finally, you have the situation relating to Afghanistan. There are questions asked because what has the traumatic events of recent days have uh, forced us to, to reflect. One of the questions that has been put and, uh, is, is Afghanistan South Asian, Central Asian, or West Asian? Possibly it is all three, depending on what issue is at stake at any time. It is South Asian as a member of SARC and its close ties with India and Pakistan, 
are well known and well established. It is also Central Asian in the sense that it has a long border with Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. And indeed, there is a to and fro movement all the time. It is part of West Asia because its own, uh, because its affairs for very long have been influenced by Gulf countries. Saudi Arabia was a, man, uh, was a very major player in the global jihad in the 1980s. It was also a major source of funding for the Taliban in the 1990s. And after 9-11, it has been a fairly important source of finance to the Pakistanis in order to keep the Taliban uh, expanding their role in Afghanistan. Much of this is not well documented in the public space, but it has now emerged quite uh, clearly in this regard. And therefore, there is a Saudi role. There is also a Qatari role. In 2012, a Taliban opened their office in Doha because the Americans wanted to have a platform where they could have a dialogue uh, with the Taliban. And I think Doha came forward. Uh, they are also affiliated with political Islam and therefore were possibly more comfortable with the Taliban uh, than other countries in the region. Be that as it may, Qatar has played a very major role in seeing through the political process and the agreement with the Americans that has enabled them to pack their bags and run out of the country, something that do, they do so well after leaving behind such extraordinary damage. What does all this mean for India? Any, any one of us who attempts to discuss India's interests and India's foreign policy has one very serious obstacle. That is that ever since Mr. Modi came back to power about um, in 2019, the interest of the government in foreign affairs has significantly diminished. And you find that their focus primarily is on the pursuit of their domestic agenda and the reworking of the idea of India in the image of their ideology. What you see, what passes for foreign policy is a near total absence of any vision or direction, but sporadic activities of the minister who is either found in one capital or the other, but it is, a, it is an engagement that has no substance or direction. Having said this, let us look at the issues that are most important as far as India is concerned. Top of the list would be Afghanistan. Afghanistan, we don't know what is going to happen. There is a brewing civil conflict, how serious it will be, uh, whether it will match the Northern Alliance led by Ahmad Shah Massoud. You see the presence of his son, and you also see some of the old people, Amrullah Saleh, uh, uh, in this outfit. We, are they well armed? Do they have the capacity to fight for a certain period of time? Who are the people behind them? None of this is well known to us. My own assessment, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn or prematurely, my own sense is that I can't bring myself to take this seriously. What Afghanistan needs is not another civil conflict. What it needs is a degree of good strength where you can put together a truly uh, uh, you know, moderate government that brings in different factions. Initially, I was encouraged by the fact that Taliban representatives were actually meeting Karzai as also Abdullah, Abdullah, uh, Salahuddin, Rabbani, Mutaki, etc. So it encouraged me that they are widening their, uh, their engagement and possibly this could yield a, a, a moderate and cohesive order for the country. Once you have any kind of government in Kabul, what will be its approach uh, to the country? What are the values it will bring? What will be its attitude to women, minorities, education? None of this is known to us. We have a long way to go in that regard. We also need to know what will be its attitude with regard to extremist elements. In the 1990s, we know that it had a very powerful symbiotic relationship with Al-Qaeda. Indeed, it was this relationship that had uh, got the Americans to assault the, Ameri uh, to assault the Emirates after 
Will they go back to that? And now then all of this leads to the last thought relating to Afghanistan is it's a landlocked country. It cannot survive for a day without having relationships and openings with its neighbor. Whatever the background of any government, it has to take care of the interests of its people. Economic development has to be high on its priority list. We don't know which way it will go. There is a lot of attention paid to Pakistan. And my own sense is that Pakistan, on the one hand, might be pleased that the Taliban have finally succeeded in getting rid of the Americans. But then there is this other question. How strong do you want the Taliban to be? So far, Pakistan has maintained tight control over the Taliban. But even then, there are sections within the Taliban who run an independent, who have an independent approach. Once they are in power, what kind of dependence will be there on Pakistan? What kind of, uh, how to what extent will Pakistan be allowed to influence their affairs? If you were sitting in Islamabad or Rawalpindi today, one would have every reason to be concerned because you have a soft border, massive movement of people on both sides. If there is a conflict situation, lots of people will cross the border for sanctuary into Pakistan. You could also have extremist elements fomenting extremism within Pakistan and creating disturbances for that country. And you would have uh, therefore, Pakistan has every reason for caution. I cannot imagine a responsible government in Islamabad countenancing the return of extremist elements within that country. So let us leave here. We know that there are China and Russia have been active role players, uh, occasionally in front, but mostly behind the scenes. What influence will they carry uh, with this administration? Uh, they have made some, uh, Taliban leaders have made some positive noises about China. China has also promised to invest in Afghanistan and develop the country. But China will put its money only if there is stability. Therefore, it will insist that the region be stable before it starts building its roads and bridges and railways. We will have to wait and see. The next issue we have to look at, and I see that as a significant challenge for India, is, the, is dealing with Iran. India has consistently for the last 20 years subordinated its relations with Iran uh, to our ties with the Americans. And the Iranians know that. Many of the promises made earlier to pursue ties with Iran have been dropped by the wayside by the Indians. Recently, there is a spurt of activity. This is what I called activity as an end in itself with no strategy or direction uh, is to reach out to Tehran and to see if we can take certain, uh, uh, we can do certain things together. Do recall here that the agreement that the Iranians had with us with regard to the development of Chabahar was in 2003, 10 years before Belt and Road was even dreamt of by Xi Jinping. We did nothing at all about that. All the connectivity projects that we have spoken about have remained on paper. Even when Mr. Modi visited Iran and did the tripartite agreement on uh, Chabahar and the connection with Afghanistan, we didn't do anything at all because within a year, Trump had come into the White House. If you were sitting in Tehran, you would be a little skeptical about these Indian overtures. I also need to mention that Iran was very badly hit by the sanctions. Its people were deliberately starved and impoverished. Its children were denied medicine and food. Why could we not have done something useful at that time? We should have come forward to the Iranians and said, look, I know you are passing through hard times. Your middle class is getting impoverished. Here is something that India will do for you. But we didn't do anything. So now this relationship, you run to Tehran and try to see where you can take the relationship. Off. The Chinese and Russians have been consistently there in Iran. They have built a relationship, political, defense, economic, a comprehensive strategic partnership agreement. Details not known, but it's a 25-year agreement. So we have to 
take a look at that and see where it will go. Long ago, when I was more hopeful about the government, I used to talk about India playing a role in promoting regional security. Uh, the region needs a holistic approach. It has so many diverse issues in different places. Uh, unless you have a regional security, cooperative regional security arrangement, you're never going to have peace uh, in that region. And I had envisaged India leading such a diplomatic effort. I am now no longer that enthusiastic. I've written a lot about it. I've circulated my papers and proposals very extensively. But the way I look at the government, I'm not enthused. I'm, for example, let me end on this note that we have a senior minister who's a former uh, diplomat who says that looking at the situation of Sikhs and Hindus in Afghanistan, we now know the justification for the Citizen Amendment Act, Citizenship Amendment Act. Is the minister blind and deaf? He cannot see on the television screen hundreds of thousands of Afghan people suffering and very insecure about the future. And he can only mention two communities that have lived in Afghanistan for the last 400 years, seen enormous vicissitudes. They think of themselves as Afghan and you suddenly think, so it is domestic agenda constantly trumping India's national interest, India's foreign policy and India's standing in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It was very, very eloquent and uh, very powerful thoughts that you have presented. Uh, so really, we have learned a lot. Thank you so much. Um, we'll take keep the questions uh, for later. I would now invite Professor Aftab, Aftab Kamal Pasha for his remarks. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ritika Sundar. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please come. Okay. Uh, 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 thanks uh, to the Institute uh, Impact and Policy Research Institute uh, for inviting me and also for hosting a brilliant lecture by Ambassador Tilmiz uh, Ahmad. Uh, Tilmiz Ahmad Saab has been a veteran diplomat uh, who has served uh, in many West Asian countries, especially Gulf countries uh, from Iraq to UAE, Oman, Saudi Arabia for many, many years. And he has studied and uh, uh, researched on this uh, region uh, ever since uh, he has been associated uh, uh, as an IFS officer. And I had the privilege of uh, meeting him uh, several times in the region uh, while I was serving as a part-time diplomat for the ICCR in Cairo for the Indian Cultural Center. Uh, during one of my visit to Riyadh, uh, not only he conducted uh, his office work with meticulous uh, uh, interest and uh, the mountains of files he would clear, but, uh, uh, and also the, as a host, uh, uh, hosting many uh, parties uh, for dignitaries, etc. I also found him uh, taking time to read books. He's a voracious reader, writer, and uh, a very argumentative diplomat, I must say. He has brilliant ideas, very sharp uh, views, very strong views also. Uh, uh, and uh, I found him extremely well-read, uh, well-informed and uh, articulate. Uh, in this lecture, uh, he has uh, given us a wide canvas, uh, starting with the wrongdoings of uh, President Donald Trump, his destructive interventions, uh, what he calls the robust military intervention in uh, the region in uh, uh, covered Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, and the diminished US presence globally, and in particular, the West Asian region, taking us through the Abraham Accords, the normalization initiated through Israeli domestic politics to Turkish ambitions and uh, Egypt's forays in uh, Africa. <clears throat> and of course, the current Afghan situation uh, uh, and the lack of interest in uh, Narendra Modi's second term as prime minister uh, uh, or lack of uh, substance or direction as he calls uh, it. Uh, 
uh, and also we saw how uh, Indian interests are intertwined uh, and uh, his focus on Iran, what we could have done and what we have achieved. And uh, finally, his pet theme of uh, security and stability and what India could have done and uh, uh, what uh, he views it uh, currently as far as India's engagement militarily or in the defense area is concerned. Uh, having covered such a vast canvas uh, from Iran to Morocco and from Turkey to Sudan, uh, but uh, I still feel there are some uh, areas, uh, given the limited time he had at his disposal, uh, uh, I broadly agree uh, to his uh, presentations, but I would flag some of the issues uh, uh, which uh, uh, participants or listeners would be interested and then come down to a critique of uh, his uh, extensive uh, presentation. In the last one and a half year, uh, the major uh, problem uh, which has uh, bothered the people and the government has been the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, which has unnerved uh, like many other governments around the world. Uh, governments from Morocco to Iran, from Turkey to Sudan, almost 25 countries. Uh, it's a major, major challenge uh, which has uh, depleted uh, economic resources uh, of the oil-rich countries. Uh, it has uh, badly affected uh, non-oil producing countries' revenues, whether it is tourism in North Africa, or uh, the immigrant population which sends remittances. So the economic challenges uh, which uh, most of these uh, states, including Israel, Turkey, and Iran, the three non-Arab countries uh, are enormous. Uh, and in my view, uh, the socioeconomic uh, uh, challenges uh, flowing from this uh, COVID uh, pandemic and uh, the way these governments have handled uh, we will be seeing it in a much uh, bigger uh, way in the coming uh, months and years. Uh, I would uh, link this to the 2008-9 economic global meltdown, uh, especially the European countries who suffered enormously because of the changes, economic changes, uh, downturn in America. How uh, the economic problems, uh, recession in Europe impacted North African countries and other West Asian Arab countries particularly. Because uh, many of these countries, whether it is uh, Libya or Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, or even Syria and Lebanon, uh, are closely economically linked with Europe through various agreements. And when this uh, downturn uh, meltdown started, you know, this is one of the crucial reasons for the Arab Spring, whose reverberations are still being felt uh, in many countries uh, uh, of the region. So in that way, the COVID pandemic also, uh, uh, we have to keep in mind, it has uh, uh, affected severely the, the, the political management, the economic uh, uh, survival strategies, uh, and also uh, the, the psychological scars, uh, uh, which uh, would take many months to, uh, for the governments and the leaders uh, to heal. The second is the uh, hot spots, uh, which continue to bother people, regimes, and the outside world. Number one uh, I have in mind uh, is the Syrian crisis. Uh, uh, he has dealt with extensively the genesis, the regional environment, uh, global environment. But uh, I'm worried about uh, the Biden administration renewed interest uh, in supporting the, 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 the rebels uh, against uh, President Bashar al-Assad, especially Anthony Blinken, who was the point man for Syria during the earlier Obama administrations. So the Syrian crisis is going to fester much longer and the, and the instability which it has caused not only for Syria, but also for the region, I think would multiply, not to speak of the new wave of refugees who are fleeing. The second is the continuing Yemeni crisis. Uh, despite uh, 
uh, the so-called UV's withdrawal to the south or taking less interest and more in maritime affairs surrounding Yemen. The Saudi military intervention continues and uh, uh, the, the killing of civilians and destruction of infrastructure is adding uh, to the problems of uh, Yemeni people who have suffered uh, too long, uh, not only because of the military intervention, but also because of the Houthi and uh, uh, South Yemeni uh, problems uh, between the North and uh, South. So whatever little infrastructure is left is again being destroyed and uh, uh, crippled uh, with the people like earlier what happened in Somalia, being forced uh, to live on uh, handouts of the external uh, uh, funding agencies. And I'm af afraid uh, that uh, since both the parts of Yemen have uh, maritime borders, Red Sea and yeah, the Bab al-Mandab and uh, Gulf of Aden, this may become another Somalia with piracy and uh, maritime uh, issues uh, uh, coming to the prominence. Uh, the third one is some of the issues which were raised during the Arab Spring continue to haunt uh, the people, the leaders, and the outside world. Uh, uh, none of the uh, states uh, have seen uh, Tunisia for a while saw stability, but again it has uh, degenerated into uh, dictatorship uh, of an elected president uh, and the continuing civil war and killings in Libya and uh, the, 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 the dictatorship in Egypt, uh, which continues to uh, disregard uh, its own people uh, and uh, violation of human rights and lack of democracy, not to speak of uh, any uh, basic uh, uh, rights which uh, even military dictators uh, grant to their own citizens. It's a very repressive uh, uh, situation in Egypt, uh, although Ambassador Talmi Zabad has appreciated Sisi's uh, active diplomacy in Africa, but there is hardly anything uh, he can show. The domestic roots of a successful foreign policy of a country is how it treats its own people, how it solves its own citizens' problem, whether it is unemployment or social problems or inflation or creation of jobs and security and so on and so forth. In all of these parameters, uh, not only Egypt and its dictators have uh, failed, but uh, it's uh, uh, sad scene in much of the uh, region, including uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, the uh, other hotspots uh, not uh, uh, finding mention is uh, the enormous pressure on Lebanese people. They are not only under pressure from a lack of uh, government uh, uh, or the domination by Hezbollah, but also Israel and Syria and Turkey and the Gulf countries and the United States and France in particular have been squeezing the Lebanese people so much, but uh, 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 you know, the world is silent uh, about uh, their agony, their pain, their suffering, uh, which might explode uh, uh, in one way or the other. Then, of course, uh, uh, the old festering Arab-Israeli conflict, conflict and how continuous uh, bombardment of the Gaza Strip uh, uh, is uh, creating uh, unspeakable uh, problems uh, faced by the uh, Palestinians who are blockaded and, uh, uh, you know, suffering uh, for so long. Uh, you know, these uh, also are all hotspots which uh, would, uh, uh, you know, show signs of uh, renewed intifada, for example, even in West Bank where the uh, Abbas uh, PA is under fire for adopting rep repressive policies. Uh, so an explosive situation uh, has reached uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, which even the Bennett, Naftali Bennett government may not be able to contain in the future, given the, uh, the plight of uh, the, uh, the Palestinians, uh, as also the Israeli citizens uh, who are Palestinians in uh, uh, Israel proper, who are under tremendous uh, pressure for various uh, reasons. So lack of democracy and the dictatorial role of the monarchies and the continuous violation of uh, human rights in all of these countries across the board 
uh, and the internally displaced people, whether it is uh, in Iraq or Syria or Libya or <clears throat> in Yemen uh, or uh, other countries uh, or to external countries, uh, borders uh, in Europe, particularly the sad uh, uh, drowning of people in the Mediterranean uh, and the hundreds and thousands which are uh, uh, living in forest and very difficult circumstances in EU borders. All these uh, are also uh, uh, developments which need to be uh, kept in mind. Uh, the, the, the Abraham, of course, of course, of course uh, have taken us through Bahrain, through uh, uh, Morocco and uh, uh, Jordan uh, and uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad brilliantly gave us the inside picture of why Saudi Arabia has not followed these uh, uh, countries. But uh, uh, the, the, the internecine uh, fighting within the Saudi ruling family uh, and the desire of uh, the Crown Prince uh, to have control over the uh, political affairs uh, uh, they are not uh, signs of uh, stability as we have seen uh, Saudi Arabia for decades. Uh, there is bound to be turmoil, not only because of this fight within the family, but also because of the restlessness of the Shias in the eastern part where bulk of the oil is located. And also the very inhuman decisions uh, in the southwest where Yemenis are being expelled on a daily basis, hundreds and thousands from Jeddah, through Asir, Najran, and Sharura, and other places are being literally expelled, uh, hounded uh, from these Saudi territories, uh, although they have been living uh, in these areas because these uh, regions uh, belong to Yemen in the first place, which were occupied by the Saudis uh, during and after the First World uh, War. So Yemen uh, 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 is also uh, very uh, important uh, area of concern uh, if we survey the uh, recent developments uh, along with Syria and Libya. <laughs> uh, the other thing which one should note is the non-state actors. Uh, uh, it is not just Hamas or Hezbollah, uh, but the several non-state actors in Iraq uh, which are fighting for an end to American presence there uh, uh, for an end to Saudi Gulf interventions in Iraqi affairs or to the Iraqi uh, Turkish support to the Kurds or intervention. So Iraq is also boiling to a large extent uh, uh, because of all of these uh, non-state actors who are uh, who have access to sophisticated weapons. Uh, we have seen their attacks on American bases uh, uh, for the last uh, more than uh, one year. Uh, the other area of concern is the uh, election of uh, new president in Iran, Raisi. Whether uh, he will follow some of the policies which Hassan Rouhani had initiated, whether uh, his attitude towards the JCPOA will remain the same, or he will turn out to be another Ahmadi Najad uh, uh, destabilizing the region uh, uh, and the Iranian politics, uh, that remains a question mark, uh, especially given uh, the recalcitrant attitude of the United States uh, towards rejoining or conditional rejoining uh, on the JCPOA and Iran's demand for lifting of all sanctions and guarantees that uh, uh, Iran, uh, United States would be committed to this uh, nuclear uh, agreement. And also the enrichment of the uranium, uh, which has uh, raised concern in the IAEA uh, uh, and uh, European and American circles also. How far Iran can go in its quest uh, for its nuclear uh, program. Uh, the Saudi Iranian struggle, of course, uh, has destabilized the region uh, on a number of uh, issues. But uh, at the heart of it uh, uh, in the future, I think uh, uh, it has already started, uh, would be the oil prices. How much Iran can produce oil uh, to regain its world market and how much Saudi Arabia can uh, produce to shore up its economic uh, 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 resources. Already we have seen Saudi Arabia and UAE spat on this issue or the quotas. Uh, so uh, the Saudi-Iranian issues will be less of ideology and more of economic uh, struggle 
uh, in the future. Uh, and also, I think Iran has uh, kept a low profile in some of the areas where it is accused of meddling in the Arab countries. Uh, uh, so in that way, uh, the, the, the economic issues uh, will likely dominate in the coming years uh, uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. There are many other issues about how Jordan got destabilized because of the Kushner intervention, uh, the deal of the century, and how it is slowly recovering uh, in the background of uh, alleged coup attempt, uh, uh, which Saudi Arabia is supposed to have taken interest uh, uh, or uh, the continuous uh, demonstrations uh, against the rulers uh, in uh, Algeria and also the fragile governments in Morocco. All of these uh, raise eyebrows about the larger issue of political stability, about uh, how monarchs or dictators can manage the affairs of these uh, people. Uh, the, the weapons uh, which Gaddafi had accumulated, uh, of course, have uh, reached as far as beyond Sahel to Nigeria and destabilized the entire region. And we have been witnessing daily killings in, from Mali to Niger to uh, other Sahel uh, countries and uh, how uh, the, the, the non-state actors or armed groups in Syria get training or inspiration from the disturbed areas in uh, Libya also is a matter of concern and how uh, this might reach beyond the countries which we are witnessing. As far as uh, challenges are uh, concerned, uh, I agree with Ambassador uh, Talmiz Ahmed uh, that uh, for the last one and a half year, the Narendra Modi government has lost steam as far as uh, its earlier interest uh, in foreign policy, especially in this region, was concerned. You know, Modi's high-profile visits to Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, and the awards he received, uh, and the applause and uh, support of the Indian diaspora there were headlines, uh, uh, along with the promises of uh, investments from Saudi UAE to the extent of 70 billion, and Saudi Arabia, similar, uh, uh, amount, uh, nothing much is heard about uh, uh, in the strategic cooperation. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm also at uh, pain uh, that, uh, you know, we have strategic cooperation with these uh, countries uh, who are adding problems uh, uh, to our own uh, interests in this region. You know, UAE is punching uh, above its uh, weight uh, in uh, from Libya to Egypt to Tunisia to Syria to Somalia to Yemen and uh, Iraq and uh, Iran and uh, we are still strategic partners raising not a single uh, voice uh, against its oppressive policies uh, interventions in Yemen or in other uh, theaters same goes with Saudi Arabia does our strategic partnership uh, force us to remain silent and what these uh, uh, autocrats, uh, monarchs, uh, or emirates uh, do in this region, which add to our anxiety, to our uh, problems, uh, where Indians are involved, where we have to evacuate uh, from these uh, trouble uh, spots. <clears throat> uh, uh, so these strategic partners, in fact, have become problem creators. Uh, not only uh, in our relations with Iran, uh, but also uh, to our uh, relationship, uh, which uh, spans decades in Yemen or uh, in Libya or uh, in other uh, countries. The core issues, of course, uh, remain, that is our uh, dependence on uh, chemical fertilizers uh, from this region for our food security, our dependence on energy, oil and gas from the Gulf partners particularly, and the welfare of the Indian workers, uh, trade, investment. Uh, but uh, my concern uh, lately has been on the maritime security. The earlier problem of piracy from Somalia, we have somehow managed along with other countries uh, uh, to stem that. But uh, the new security concerns are the continuous attack by Iran and Israel on each other ships or even uh, other partners' uh, ships uh, where India also has been affected. So this uh, unspoken war, maritime war between these two regional powers uh, uh, 
uh, uh, is adding concerns uh, to our own uh, maritime uh, uh, attention. And uh, of course, the former foreign British foreign secretary identified uh, the non-resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict as the source of violence or terrorism in this region. And that goes uh, beyond uh, uh, saying, uh, saying anything. But uh, the interventions by Russia uh, in Syria and uh, its uh, duplicitous policy with Israel uh, and some of the other countries also raise eyebrows, uh, not to speak of uh, the new Chinese interest in Iran, along with Pakistan, how this is going to shape or impact our relations, not only with Iran, but also with Afghanistan, with Central Asia or even the uh, Gulf countries. And the continued uh, NATO denial uh, uh, in uh, some of these countries, especially Libya, uh, is a cause of concern. Turkey, of course, has been uh, trying to find space uh, for itself, uh, from Qatar uh, to Syria to Iraq to Libya and uh, Somalia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, not to speak of its hostile comments on Kashmir and the renewed uh, ties with uh, Pakistan. But uh, Turkey's uh, uh, actions or involvement uh, should not uh, so much bother Indian policymakers as uh, it would bother uh, the West Asian and North African countries uh, uh, where uh, it is identifying itself with the particular brand of Islam, uh, which is not appreciated. Uh, uh, lastly, how our uh, membership uh, in, as a non-security council permanent, uh, as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, how we can utilize uh, or the few days left as presidency, whether uh, 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 India could and should take uh, initiatives to resolve some of these hotspots problems like Yemen, Syria, uh, or uh, Libya, or even the Nile waters uh, dispute, uh, or even the Iran-US uh, uh, conflict. Uh, you know, uh, we have to, or Lebanon, or the old Arab-Israeli conflict, all of these hotspots uh, are not going to remain as they are. Uh, at times they explode and they surprise uh, uh, not only policymakers here, but uh, all of us. Uh, uh, and, you know, this region is prone for turmoil, uh, prone for revolutions, sudden wars, uh, and, uh, you know, unprecedented uh, agitations uh, spilling over from one territory to the other. So uh, this area is like a minefield, and walking through uh, for a country like India is extremely difficult, uh, whether it is uh, the Shia-Sunni sectarian divide, uh, uh, over uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, or the other countries like Bahrain and Syria and Lebanon, but also over the accumulation of weapons, uh, both by states and non-state actors, uh, because this region is one of the uh, heaviest importers of weapons from all countries, from China to Russia to European Union to America, even Brazil, uh, or even South Africa, you know, all the countries uh, want uh, to export and uh, get foreign exchange from these countries. So this region is flush with weapons. And now with nuclear plants emerging in UAE, in Saudi Arabia, or Turkey, uh, for what purpose and what direction these uh, nuclear programs would head and uh, uh, how uh, the present nuclear uh, program of Iran will be addressed uh, by not only U UN uh, agencies, but also great powers uh, which have signed the JCPOA is a matter of uh, concern. Uh, I would broadly agree with Ambassador Iran on uh, Iran, uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad on Iran. Uh, that our policy has uh, been uh, mostly a reaction to the American, the fear of America and its sanctions. Uh, uh, although I feel that there was no need to go uh, to this extent uh, and we could have learned something from China or Russia or even Turkey, uh, which is doing brisk business with uh, Iran. <clears throat> uh, our interest, uh, our on and off interest in Chabahar uh, 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 and the lack of trust between these 
two countries is going to be a major challenge in the coming years because I feel that uh, trust is not there in Indo-Iran bilateral relations. You know, we may speak about civilizational ties and so on and so forth, but uh, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, uh, the level of trust from the Iranians uh, is uh, much less, uh, however much the external affairs minister might uh, uh, try. So in that way, uh, uh, Iran is getting closer uh, to China, uh, maybe to Pakistan or to Russia in the uh, future. And if the American Biden administration continues to drag its feet on the JCPOA and sanctions uh, and continues to be beholden to UAE or Saudi Arabia or to Israel, uh, this may not help much uh, uh, to facilitate Indo-Iranian uh, relations. Uh, uh, I also agree, uh, I, in fact, I was a critic uh, of Talmi Zahama's proposal, earlier proposal for a robust Indian active uh, leading role in the security of the Gulf. Uh, because I remember after the uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, the Kuwaitis were the first to come to Delhi with the draft defense uh, agreement. We roundly rebuffed them. Uh, and we signed defense cooperation agreement later on with Qatar, with Saudi Arabia, with UAE, with Oman, which doesn't uh, mean anything to us or to them, uh, except in the field of uh, extradition of uh, known uh, criminals, uh, nothing much has happened. They were expecting much more, uh, uh, which countries like uh, 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 Turkey and others, uh, Israel are uh, filling. We are nowhere, uh, anywhere near uh, the, the, the security interest uh, uh, to look into the security interest of these uh, Gulf uh, countries. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Professor Pasha. It's like, uh, again, coming back to your classroom. So it is. it has been really, really wonderful. Uh, listening to uh, Professor Pasha and also Ambassador um, uh, Talmiz Ahmad. Uh, of course, uh, West Asia is uh, not a monolith. It has so many different problems and challenges. And also uh, how countries are interacting with uh, one another in the region and also um, India's, um, India's um, opportunities and in fact, the missed opportunities, I would uh, say in, in, in the words of uh, Ambassador Natalmiz Ahmad that we have lost the we have lost the shine in the region as was earlier purported by the uh, admin, uh, modi government so uh, i'll just take a few questions in fact some of these have been uh, some of the questions that i had was already covered by professor pasha so i'll uh, take a few questions um, for for ambassador um, and club them together for you sir uh, so, uh, what is the need for uh, the U.S. to meddle in West Asia's affairs? It's been it is a long, long drawn process for uh, for for uh, us to understand. And also, uh, how do you think the United Nations will be able to solve this Afghanistan crisis? Considering most of the funding of Un United Nations comes from the U.S. and it has itself withdrawn from Afghanistan. And here, if I can add to it. Um, what do you see the role of the OIC? Um, it hasn't much spoken about uh, the whole uh, whole dilemma that has been created by the withdrawal. So if you could talk about that. And very recently, the Economist has come out with a um, very interesting article which says that failure in Afghanistan shows that America's efforts have always centered around creating corrupt and corrupt client states. Why is it so? Would you agree with this? And uh, how, how would you respond to this, basically? So if you could take these questions. And another question is, um, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Please go ahead. Sir, please unmute. Ambassador, if you could unmute yourself. Let me answer two questions together. America's approach to countries is to create client states, and the other linked with it, why is the United States in West Asia? Uh, if you go back, uh, United States was a very uh, reluctant to get into West Asia. 
uh, even during the Cold War, the United States used to feel that West Asia belongs to the British. And they didn't want to get involved. Their only interest was at that time, they were, uh, uh, their companies were developing the oil in Saudi Arabia. But as the British abruptly announced that they were withdrawing east of Suez, the Americans had no choice. And therefore, their approach was very cautious, very reluctant, because they used to argue that, look, we don't know the region. We don't know the language. We don't know the history. We don't know the culture. We are not familiar with their faith, etc. And what are we going to do? So they came in, uh, what they had, what was called over the horizon presence. And they allowed Saudi Arabia and Iran to manage these, uh, the upholding of Western interests. Now, they, Saudi, the Americans defined their interest in the region in three points. Number one, free flow of oil and avail free availability of oil. Number one. Number two, security of Israel. And number three, ensuring that this region does not come under the control or influence of any entity, either domestic or foreign, that is hostile to Western interests. These were their three principles. I think more or less these principles have remained in place, uh, but uh, they have been certain, sometimes one issue is emphasized over the other. Now, uh, it's uh, with regard to client states, actually, as you know, these Gulf countries that emerged as a result of the withdrawal of the British, they were inherently unstable and insecure. If you recall the, th the various interventions, cartographic interventions that occurred as the British withdrew, number one, the creation of Pakistan, number two, the creation of Israel, and number three, the creation of the Gulf Sheikhdoms, none of these was ever expected to be independently secure. They were expected to be continuously dependent on an affiliation with, Western, with the Western alliance, and it was the British alliance. Therefore, it is not so much client states, these are dependencies, they're dependent states, because they do not have even the modicum of, of capacity or capability of looking after themselves. Look at the entities that were created. Uh, there's very, very small size of these uh, entities. Number two, very small population base in three countries, uh, UAE, Bahrain, and Qatar, it's the Indians who are in the majority. In UAE, Emiratis are 12%, Indians are 60%. So, you know, and you have not only, they were created for to supply oil and to ensure that Western interests are safeguarded. Therefore, right from the beginning, the region was under Western control. During the Cold War, at the height of the republics, you found that there was a divide between the traditional monarchies and the republics. But after the 67 war, it ceased to be relevant and the principal role player in the region became Saudi Arabia and the traditional monarchy. And from 1973, when the oil revenues came in, again, it became very important. You can critique the American policy on several bases, but when you come to post-Cold War, post-Cold War, US policy was determined by two forces in play, which reinforced each other. Number one, the hubris of a, of a hyperpower, a sole superpower. The United States lacked the experience, the majority, uh, the, the maturity and the wisdom to handle this unique situation in world affairs, to bring gravitas to and responsibility to this unique role that had been thrust upon it. It was hubris. Second, the extraordinary influence on U.S. policy that came to be exercised by the Israel lobby. Israel lobby, you see the beginning of the neocons at that time, where they had penetrated, Israel lobby had penetrated every aspect of U.S. life. And therefore, you see after that, from then till more or less today, U.S. policies have been influenced by Israel and by the Israeli interest getting priority over U.S. interests. So you find, for example, the dual containment. Even at that time when dual containment of Iraq and Iran was enforced, a lot of people said that why are we taking two, two enemies on for no rhyme or reason? None of them affects us. Iraq was already emasculated. 
Then you have the war on uh, Iraq. The war on Iraq became a priority, indeed an obsession for the neocons. Confrontation with Iran, an obsession with the neocons. So, and that neocons, even though there is no George Bush Jr. anymore, their influence remains because they penetrated very deep into the Republican Party. And the Republican Party has got an extremely hard right element, which, is the, uh, which was the support base for Trump. Uh, could the American policy now change? You see, the a third point, before I go forward, sorry. Many of the interventions that the Americans made, uh, largely to subserve the interests of the neocons and the Israel lobby in general, they were very ill thought out. Nobody, you see, every time you take a major action, diplomatic or military, you have to think through, A, what are my objectives? B, what is the time frame? C, what are the resources that I have to bring to bear? And number four, what is my exit strategy? If you look at the history relating to US intervention, both in Afghanistan as well as with regard to Iraq, you see none of these are spelled out. No US administration ever had any clarity about what they were doing in Afghanistan. So rather than becoming a client state, you found that there were actually massive insurgencies. None of them ever became a client state. The Taliban were back in Afghanistan within two or three years after the destruction of the Emirates. And at no stage were the Americans ever able to control Pakistan. You have to ask yourself the question that if a country is going to spend $2 trillion dollars should it not build assets and relationships by itself? Till the last day, till Doha, till the Doha agreement, the Americans continued to depend on the Pakistanis to deliver the Taliban. They had, Americans had no direct contact with the Taliban at all. And they were depending on a country whose interest and American interest did not coincide at all. It was actually getting funding for the Americans, which is used on the Taliban, and Taliban then shot the Americans. A very weird, very bizarre situation. Then what were the Americans doing there? What were the resources? You never knew about the resources. A general would come. The president would want to withdraw. The general would come and say, do the search. The Americans at one time had 150,000 soldiers. And then they brought them down to 8,500. The entire discussion now at Doha was about the 5,000 soldiers. When 150,000 could not do anything, what are 5,000 going to do? Big deal. Iraq, exactly the same failure. So it's not a business of client state. It was the total inability to control any of the territories that they invaded. The others were not clients. They were dependencies. There was no way they were going to ever function on their own. Now, with regard to the question about UN and OIC, both are totally non-functional and have no role to play. The United Nations are supposed to provide some degree of uh, welfare. I think they have done that job. They have no political role uh, whatsoever in that country. Now, OIC, there is always a question relating to OIC, and I must clarify it to your listeners. The OIC is a bogus institution. It has only been set up by the Saudis. It is funded by the Saudis. It is located uh, in Saudi Arabia and is controlled by the Saudis only to provide political support for the various decisions that Saudi Arabia takes from time to time. And in return, Saudi Arabia allows all members total freedom to abuse a non-member. So what Pakistan does is to use the OIC platform to abuse India. But from the day the OIC was constructed, was set up in 1968 after the Rabat conference, 1971, I think 1771, it became formal. It has not contributed anything to any trouble spot anywhere in the world. In fact, I would go so far as to say it has done nothing for the interests of the Muslim community or for the member countries that have joined it. Saudi Arabia has also ensured that the OIC will never experience any revamping or reform. So it's, according to me, an inert and bogus organization. 
and it is incapable. It only passes very long document it has uh, of resolution, so-called resolution. Many of these resolutions are not even discussed or debated in the platform of the OIC. Many countries that we used to complain to with regard to uh, the OIC resolutions against India, they said we didn't even read these resolutions because Pakistan has a free hand in passing them. By the way, they do a lot of other countries also get that. So uh, we are looking at a very untidy scenario. I would say that we don't, I don't think any of the major players know which way things will go. They are all watching the situation carefully. If I was sitting in Moscow or in Beijing, that is what I would do. You consult with each other. Possibly they have better representation on the ground. I would also keep a sharp eye on what the conflict is in Panjshir Valley. I'm a little skeptical about it, as I mentioned. I don't know whose adventure it is and who is behind it. Um, you and I can make our own guess, but I don't think it's going anywhere. Uh, you remember that after the Soviets withdrew, Afghanistan experienced civil conflict for five years. After the Soviets withdrew, when the Afghan warlords fought with each other, relentlessly, brutally. More Afghans were killed in that five years of civil conflict than in the entire Soviet occupation of that country. They used to do bombings, I don't, you remember, bombings of Kabul. Sustained bombardment of Kabul was done by these wretched Afghans. So you have, if that's how the Taliban came. Pakistanis created the Taliban and bring them into the so I am skeptical about the civil conflict and I wouldn't like to see it. I'm not sure if anyone is in a position to play a role. Part, there are role players. I think Saudi Arabia is one, Qatar is another, UAE is there, Pakistan is there. What degree of influence they actually bring to bear on the table remains to be seen. The point to emphasize is that the Taliban is not a monolithic organization. It has, for example, its number two, who is the military commander, is from the Haqqani network. Haqqani network is an extremely brutal, extremely violent, and totally independent organization. It has been fed by the ISI, but it doesn't listen to the ISI. So we have to... I think there are also reports of several thousand Pakistanis who are an integral part of the Taliban. Now, a situation of conflict is quite different from the situation in government. And it remains to be seen what kind of governments these people are going to offer. We don't have any previous experience of it, but it remains to be seen which way they will go. Right. Yes, sir. thank you so much. In fact, uh, this, these reports uh, are actually leading to so many conclusions that uh, there are these Talibanis coming in the direction through, you know, the POK and they are already in, in uh, plans to attack India and all those things. I don't, by the way, if you uh, let me, before you go forward, that's yeah. rubbish. Yeah. That's rubbish. Mm -hmm. Let's be very objective here. I know there is a discourse in India yeah. that the Taliban victory somehow threatens Kashmir. Let us get our facts together. The issue of Kashmir is from 1989. Mm. Consistent. The jihad in Kashmir is 100% controlled by Pakistan and specifically by its ISI. They will not allow anyone not under their control to enter uh, the scenario relating to Kashmir, to Jammu and Kashmir. Everyone who does cross-border terror is managed and controlled by the ISI. I, second, Taliban are not interested in cross-border activities. Taliban are a strictly national entity. Number three, is Taliban going to become a sanctuary for extremists like Al-Qaeda or whatever? The Taliban hate the Islamic State. Some of the massive attacks on Islamic State, Khorasan, were carried out by the Taliban. Yes, there may be Al-Qaeda operatives. Now, look at the map. If you had Al-Qaeda operatives, are you going to see them reaching India? I would imagine that their first, any the three countries that should be most threatened are Pakistan, China, and Russia. That is there. That's why they are there. That's what they are concerned about. Please do not highlight the issue. Now, come back to Jammu and Kashmir. Jammu and Kashmir is a Pakistan-managed event uh, uh, going on for more than 30 years. 80,000 people dead. 20,000 security officers there. There were no Taliban there. 
nobody no outsider is there they are all pakistanis they were initially kashmiris and even now i am told some odd kashmiri is involved overwhelmingly they are pakistani nationals intent on jihad right so i want to correct this impression very strongly that taliban have nothing to do with india and if i am going to say something and that is india's problems do not lie outside its borders all of india's problems lie within its borders we have today the indian muslim community has refused to be radicalized with all the provocations over the last 30 years not one indian muslim joined the al qaeda not one indian muslim ever joined the taliban not only 22 malayalis landed up in raqqa only 25 people landed up at islamic state khorasan out of the community of 200 million though we have had the kashmir jihad for more than 30 years from the rest of india no indian muslim has joined that jihad the indian muslim is not concerned about transnational jihad and is not involved with it his total commitment is to the democratic and secular order of india that is the thing the concern that we should have is the term i have coined cross communal radicalization that is the communalization the communal politics which is coming from the uh, authorities concerned and from the uh, and from their ideology is a greater danger to india than anybody uh, who uh, seizes power in afghanistan so let us not confuse ourselves with what is the real threat and what is the imagined threat right sir thank you thank you so much sir in fact we really require such strong opinion because responsible and uh, informed media is a thing that is really needed these days so thank you so much i'll just put one uh, final question before we move to the final way forward round is that uh, what are your views is uh, what are your views on uh, the us moving its embassy uh, from uh, tel aviv to jerusalem and uh, india has already maintained that uh, we are going to stay in tel aviv so um, do you see any significance of this or is it just an uh, a sovereign decision you see for a four year period the united states was a president whose mental balance is in serious doubt and he did a series of actions mostly thoughtless mostly without reflection mostly without thinking of any uh, implication foreign policy implication trump's support base consisted of two two pillars number one individuals wealthy individuals who were jewish donors like sheldon els you know elders you know i mean you know adelson who gave him a few hundred million dollars hardcore right wing he ran a casino made his money in the casino but otherwise hard right and totally committed to israel's extreme right wing number one number two were the christian evangelists the christian evangelists with deep respect to their thinking they truly believe and they have convinced themselves that once all of palestine becomes jewish it will it will expedite the second coming of jesus christ at which time all the jews will either have to convert to christianity or they will die a horrible death so they are a support base for israel israelis are not bothered about phase 2 when they are to be annihilated because they say it's not our belief but so long as we get political support so donald trump was under tremendous pressure from these donors as well as from the christian evangelists and that is why many of the actions that he has taken are linked with that so the shift from tel aviv to jerusalem now the, the biden is not going to reverse it we have to accept it as a given what the americans had thought long ago you know when congress passed the act in 1993 the us presidents have successive us presidents have postponed the decision on security grounds the american possibility vague idea was that once you have a comprehensive peace agreement in the region at that time we can address the issue of the status of east jerusalem what trump has done is to reverse the thing he has already recognized it and taken away the card that the americans were possibly going to have i you can have your own view about how serious the americans are ever going to be with regard to taking any 
important decisions relating to the future. I personally feel, and this is uh, a very much a personal view, I personally feel that with regard to the Arab Palestine, with regard to the Israel Palestinian issue, no one else's views matter. Things will keep on happening confrontations, violence, intimidation, cruelties. At some stage, they will have to sit together. And when will that happen? When there is a major change in Israel. Israel has still the xenophobia of Zionism. I quoted to you an American scholar who says the time for Zionism is over. This is Chaz Friedman. Chaz Freeman is a very distinguished American writer. And I must confess, I was impressed. He said Zionism has only inculcated in Israel racism, violence, and abuse. And it's a time to give it up. Imagine a situation, and that's the Eldorado I'm looking at, that as these Israelis, particularly younger people, start engaging with Arabs and find the relationship and interaction uh, constructive and useful and attractive, you could, and therefore they may have a key, different view of what their country is all about. At the moment, they have a conflict. They are conflicted. Are we Jew? Is our state Jewish or is our state democratic? The swing, their state is Jewish because of Zionism. The pathway from Zionism to democracy will give you the one state which is going to be the final solution the solution of this problem. I don't want to use the word final solution and get it misunderstood. But it is the final settlement of this issue. Only the Israelis can deliver on this. Otherwise, you will keep on killing. And the Palestinians have never given up. Look back. From 67 till today, there has not been a single day when Israel has been at peace. Because the Palestinians you keep on killing them and keep on killing them and keep on killing them. But they And they have no weaponry. They will pick up a rock, but they will not give up. So in this situation, while the Israelis keep on using firepower, which they have, I don't imagine the American attitude will change. I see them, I've studied their history, their political order. I'll tell you very frankly, I told an American this, he was shocked. But it's objectively correct. It is a dysfunctional country. It's a totally dysfunctional country because you have elections every two years. Therefore, no government and a presidential election every four years. There is no continuity in strategic perception. You saw what happened with Obama struggles with the nuclear agreement. And this idiot comes and just withdraws from it. No explanation to anybody. You know, so it's a dysfunctional order. It is incapable of strategic thinking. It has very powerful interest groups and lobbies. And as a result, it will never have a coherent policy approach. What is the good thing that is happening is that the hubris that had emerged in the 1990s and continued in the first decade, the serious setbacks and mistakes that the Americans made has, I think, eroded the hubris. Does that mean that it will remain like this? Perhaps not. The second thing is the rise of China. And the China and Russia working together, they will become the constraint, the restraint on this. Uh, uh, I have written in my book, this tormented wild beast. You see, after 9-11, the way they conducted themselves is like, oh, you've shot me. You lost 3,000 people. Not, no American knows that Al-Qaeda was created by the Americans. When I told this to certain Americans just after 9-11, they were stunned. Because they had been told to believe there's something seriously wrong with Islam and the Arabs. And I told them that it's your country which funded this organization. You used jihad against, you know, for a political purpose. You brought 100,000 Muslims abroad to the Pak Afghan border. Who funded it? It's the Americans and the Saudis. So you, they don't know history. They have no knowledge, no knowledge of politics, no knowledge of culture. And yet they have this massive military power which they unleash upon these countries, savagely damage them. But you will see, not once have they succeeded. Every intervention of theirs has ended in defeat. 
By defeat, I mean that you had certain objectives, you failed. Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. All of these great superpowers. So today that superpower is diminished and has lost credibility. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll now move to the uh, way forward and the concluding remarks. And uh, I would uh, invite Professor Pasha to, um, to, to talk about uh, how are we looking and acting West? Uh, what are your recommendations to intensify <coughs> our Act West strategy, if at all there is any? Uh, and, and also, uh, what is the possibility for the situation of peace and cooperation? Uh, in, in West Asia. And also you, you touched a little bit about the non-permanent membership of India. Um, if you could uh, point, some, uh, point out some bullet, bullets about how India could harness its position uh, as this uh, non-permanent member. And, um, and, and also, um, because China is all over, China and Russia, in fact, China more is all over the region. How should India, uh, uh, you know, adopt its strategies? Uh, should it make its presence felt more enthusiastically and with more vigor than what it already is? And we sh or should we just continue our engagement in the manner it is at present? So if you could uh, talk a little bit about th these points and your concluding remarks as to the way forward. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take up the last point uh, about uh, India's membership uh, as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. You know, just as uh, uh, we took initiative a week ago on Afghanistan uh, uh, convening uh, as president, uh, the special meeting, emergency meeting on Afghanistan, where uh, you had fairly good uh, uh, discussion and opening remark by the UN Secretary General. Uh, but uh, later on, I hear that Russia and China wanted uh, Pakistan also to be invited uh, for the discussion, which uh, uh, India was not uh, open for. So the Indo-Pak problems uh, have acted as a constraint uh, on what we can pursue uh, at the high table uh, at the UN Security Council, even uh, as president of the council for a month. Uh, you see, the India has been aspiring to be a permanent of the UN Security Council. We need to go beyond the petty Indo-Pakistan uh, disputes uh, and its spillover uh, on our larger role. You know, we tend to see whether it is in Afghanistan as a zero-sum game. If uh, Pakistan has an edge there, it is a loss for us. Or uh, in other areas with uh, China, you know, we need to come out of this uh, box and uh, see uh, ourselves uh, as an important player in global affairs. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to remind uh, listeners of what we did when we were uh, not so much economically well off or as nuclear power in the 50s and 60s. We did take uh, interest uh, and played an active role from Congo to Vietnam to uh, Korea and uh, in the nuclear uh, arms race, diplomacy, so on and so forth. So I don't see any reason uh, why India should not uh, uh, take up at the UN Security Council in consultation with uh, both its friends and uh, critics. Uh, I don't see any reason why India should not take interest in convening a meeting on Yemen, for example, or uh, Syria, for example, or even Libya. Uh, uh, you see, all the UN envoys and approaches have not really worked, but uh, if something, uh, uh, alternative uh, proposal uh, uh, from uh, a non-Western state like India, if it comes working paper, which can be developed uh, on all of these hotspots, not to speak of uh, other areas uh, of interest in the global arena, you know, it will enhance our own uh, acceptability, credibility, and uh, uh, the enormous influence uh, we have, you know, having got elected uh, several times as non-permanent member. <laughs> so, uh, uh, India should uh, rise above uh, this uh, local subcontinental frictions uh, uh, and uh, uh, have creative, I'm sure there are brilliant diplomats in the MEA and outside the MEA who would uh, uh, 
uh, give ideas how to go about, but the lack of political will on the part of this government uh, is a sorry state of affairs. Uh, you know, uh, whether it is uh, our relations with Iran or with UAE or Saudi Arabia or, or any part of this uh, region or beyond, we tend to give the impression that uh, we are behaving like a small state not as a responsible uh, big Asian uh, power uh, uh, with long years of uh, interest, uh, experience in diplomacy, in, in our uh, rich culture, civilizational heritage, and a huge country. You know, we are not, a, we should not give the impression that our foreign policy is subordinated to the United States uh, uh, on critical issues where it uh, affects our national interest. So what I would suggest is we need to have an independent, autonomous uh, foreign policy uh, with regular uh, interactions. You know, in the first four years, the Modi government was active, visiting here, there, uh, but uh, suddenly they have lost interest. Uh, there was a spat with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, then we uh, had problems with Turkey, or uh, with other countries, we have lost interest of Egypt uh, uh, and uh, other countries. So this zigzag uh, policy, inconsistencies, <clears throat> and uh, ad hoc uh, approaches uh, with no clear vision is a bane uh, for uh, foreign policy. There needs to be sustained interest at the highest level. You know, imagine a country like uh, uh, Turkey, it invites the Ethiopian prime minister uh, for talks on Nile. What prevents us from uh, taking interest uh, on uh, such issues, uh, whether it is Yemen or uh, other countries of direct interest to us, uh, or Syria, which has been ravaged, which impacts uh, many countries in this uh, region. So I am disappointed as an Indian, uh, uh, as a specialist on international affairs, that uh, we need to pursue a much more energetic uh, foreign policy, uh, especially in an area of Gulf region, West Asia, which is of great importance to us. What happens there, whether it is uh, high oil prices, which impacts our budget, our inflation, our people, or the wars there, which has led to oil shocks, uh, or the Arab Spring, or the revolutions, uh, which leads to violence, uh, extremism. You know, all these things we need to very carefully monitor, and we need to have uh, people uh, uh, monitoring regularly on this area. You know, the UGC had started a Gulf Studies program, which was the only in, uh, one in India, in Jain, you located here, and for lack of funds, they have closed it for the last three years. It is a matter of shame that the country like India uh, doesn't have uh, a few thousand rupees to support a program, which is of great importance uh, given our uh, nearly 8 million workers there and 80% uh, dependence on energy from this region or trade over $100 billion and you know, extremely important from security, stability and maritime uh, perspective. So that is my take on UN and what India could do, should do. The other related point is, you know, unless, as Ambassador pointed out, we put our house in order, all these uh, hiccups uh, about uh, the policy ideological differences, uh, the communal politics, and, you know, various uh, uh, avoidable uh, things of polarization in the Hindu Muslim community and CIA and unnecessary provocations, you know, all this leads uh, us to uh, problems in our interaction with even our friends. You know, you see the social media in Gulf countries, how critical it is of the NDA government or BJP government and it's uh, some of the controversial policies uh, uh, to which uh, Ambassador uh, alluded uh, to, uh, especially the Afghan uh, CAA, Hindu Sikhs and uh, etc. So uh, India's domestic problems uh, uh, need to be, as uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee pointed out, you know, we should not create a situation in the domestic arena which will force us to bow our heads uh, in front of other countries. Uh, he was very right, and uh, 
unless we put our house in order, uh, others will not take us seriously, whether it is on Afghanistan or uh, in the Gulf affairs or in the larger uh, international arena. Uh, uh, we have to act wisely, domestically, uh, and uh, project ourselves as a responsible power. You know, we have to live up to our own traditions. We claim to be the largest democracy. But still, if we do things uh, which are seen as undemocratic or violation of human rights, it will be questioned at the international level, what is our commitment uh, uh, as a uh, permanent veto building power at the uh, UN? Secondly, the, I have a slightly di different take uh, on US-Israeli relations, which Ambassador pointed out. You see, uh, basically, I agree with him that domestic changes in Israel will impact on how it shapes its relations with Palestinians. But my own understanding is that, uh, you see, until and unless uh, the United States uh, uses its leverage over Israel, Israeli leaders are not going to listen. Whether it is military aid, economic aid, political support, or at the UN, or at the global level, you know, the crucial UN support uh, uh, is now being increasingly questioned, whether it is in Congress or the military aid or how Israel uses its uh, American weapons or the billions of dollars as economic aid and uh, uh, its policy towards uh, uh, the Palestinians, uh, not only in occupied territories, but also within uh, Israel. So uh, even in the American universities, uh, I was a Fulbright uh, scholar in Minnesota State University there. I've seen how uh, even in universities, large number of uh, Americans, whites, uh, who are uh, otherwise uh, very supremacist and others, they have become fed up with uh, blind support to Israel. Uh, and uh, many groups have emerged uh, among the academics, in the press, and in the larger uh, society. And that is reflected in the number of people who get elected to the Congress, uh, whether it is of Arab origin or members who can speak up like Bernie Sanders and uh, a large number of growing numbers uh, in the House and in the Senate. So American uh, uh, blind support uh, has enabled, uh, emboldened Israel to commit the monstrous policies uh, not only against the Palestinians, but also uh, against Iran, against many other actors, uh, uh, whichever uh, is seen as a threat to Israel. So American, uh, just as people are talking about declining American power uh, and its inability uh, or its withdrawal syndrome from the Gulf region and elsewhere, as indicated by its withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan, it is committed to withdraw from uh, Iraq by the end of this year, and general uh, non-involvement. Uh, so all of this shows that uh, the future of U.S. Israeli ties uh, also is going to be increasingly questioned, and that will uh, shape, uh, or it should shape how Israel acts within Israel on uh, its occupied territories and how it uh, threatens other countries in the Gulf region. Uh, of course, U.S. has discredited itself and uh, invited the anti-Americanism, which is uh, universal in this uh, region. And uh, it is, as I pointed out, uh, uh, the undemocratic uh, rulers uh, who are uh, dependent on the American security, uh, political support, uh, use force uh, and repression to remain in uh, power. As far as the last point is concerned, how peace can be brought to this region, you see, unless and until we identify the core hotspots, whether it is the non-resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict or the continued regime change attempts by the United States and Europe in Iran or Syria or Libya, or uh, other countries, you know, the outside interference is a bane. And uh, this has to be checked until, unless uh, uh, grassroots movements or NGOs and support to democratic forces uh, is not given. The tra transition uh, from uh, these uh, repressive uh, dictators uh, would continue to destabilize uh, this uh, region. You know, imagine in uh, Oman, the Arab Spring took place there, but hardly reported uh, during the Sultan.
Dan Khabu's period, and he tried to change the ministers and give uh, economic benefits, but uh, that did not solve the problem. Uh, uh, now there is a raging problem uh, because of the low oil prices and Oman is not a major oil exporting uh, country. Uh, similarly, is the case in Bahrain uh, or uh, the, uh, the, the Saudis themselves are facing the crunch of low oil prices uh, uh, along with uh, uh, other countries. So in that way, uh, the, the, the oil prices also along with lack of democracy uh, is going to be a problem and uh, this uh, uncertainty over american approach towards iran uh, is allowing china russia turkey and other countries to fish in troubled waters now, i don't think turkey would have taken such a big leap or china would have gone beyond what it is doing in iran signing a 25 year uh, agreement with uh, iran uh, which would impact into Iranian relations uh, and bring Pakistan and Iran also closer. But uh, beyond that, you know, Chinese are very, very active and we seem to take it lightly. It is going to be a major uh, challenge in the coming uh, decades, given the consistent uh, uh, approach of the Chinese uh, to uh, isolate, uh, to encroach, uh, uh, to strengthen their presence uh, in, in each and every country. Wherever we are there, uh, they are slowly pushing step by step uh, and we might end up uh, in the coming years uh, uh, being worried about uh, why we did not uh, think and take uh, concrete steps uh, uh, towards uh, China by using our influence uh, uh, in these uh, countries where uh, people look towards India, whether uh, it was uh, Saudi Arabia or UAE or Bahrain or Oman, all these countries uh, wanted India to take an active role in variety of fields. But we seem to have lost team. We seem to have lost interest. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, we give the impression that our policy is influenced by Israel or America or uh, our own incompetence uh, 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 as far as our approach to this uh, region is uh, concerned. So uh, the rise of China is, uh, for me, a very important uh, uh, factor in the coming years, which will be a major challenge to our diplomacy, because uh, America has convinced itself that this they have burned their fingers very badly in this region. And uh, by their identification, they have uh, discredited themselves uh, 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 and this is paving the way for, uh, in a very aggressive way, the expansion of Chinese influence from arms sale to economic benefits to pushing aggressively BRI, sending their own workers uh, in this region and uh, making uh, this uh, as a hub for their forays in Africa and uh, beyond. I think it's a matter of great uh, concern. Uh, we don't seem to have uh, really... Uh, taken this, this uh, uh, approach of the Chinese uh, in the right uh, spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Very important points uh, you raised and thank you very much for those, uh, for those way forward and how we can achieve peace. So I would now invite Ambassador uh, for his concluding remarks. And uh, sir, if you could also touch upon your policy recommendations on India's engagement with West Asia. So please unmute. With regard to the events in the region, I think we have covered them very comprehensively. And uh, we have given a very good uh, overview of the stresses and tensions that are prevailing. Over, uh, overall, there are many areas of uncertainty. We do not know which way the Biden administration will shape its foreign policy. They do not have even senior officers in place. They do not have most of their ambassadors in place. Uh, they seem to be floundering. In these early days, the administration has not shone with efficiency. And there is a near total absence of clarity with regard to a strategic vision. What you hear about you know, uh, it's something which need not have been emphasized the way it has been. Our top priority is China. 
her principal uh, challenge is china but you know that was well known and well uh, you don't have to announce it are you what are you planning to do with that you have to engage with that country so the first days have not been particularly impressive i think that the chinese russian relationship has got a lot of resonance and i think it has strengthened itself they have prepared a very solid base for their presence and control of events in what i have called eurasia i have written an academic paper on the subject but i have identified in that very strong relations they have put together with iran turkey pakistan and afghanistan if you look at the map it is a contiguous uh, territorial space they are also very very active involved actively involved in west asia so we have to watch that situation as well uh we uh, with regard to india uh, both uh, um, uh, uh, dr pasha and i have agreed that the the government has not inspired much confidence it seems to have taken its eye off it is so robustly focused on uh, forthcoming elections it's like an obsession a uh, hardly is one election over the next one may be a year away but already they are in election mode and are doing everything possible some of the most damaging thing with because they are connected with an election you know the manipulation of rules some of the statements beating up of certain people etc all of this linked with election so that is a uh, uh, it is not very impressive and i must say and i agree with dr pasha here look if people are watching you they don't have to always say things but there is a deep seated sense of concern about the way india is going now i am going to say something which will be very painful nobody takes india seriously anymore many times at seminars and conferences people say Oh, what do you think that so and so will think about India? I said they don't even think about India, because India has withdrawn from the arena. Therefore, India's views don't count. Which views have we articulated on any subject which could be taken seriously by somebody? Which initiative and activity have we done? I mentioned to you Chabahar. Chabahar was two thousand three. Can we not? If I have a relationship with the Americans. do not do i not have the capacity to tell the american look we can only be a strategic partner if we are equal and equality means mutual respect i am not your client state and you have to be sensitive to my interest i live in this region you are far away you have domestic compulsions to uh, have this maximum pressure on iran why is it applicable to me you don't want to do business with iran please don't but i depend on iran i have got uh, energy connectivity i have trade and investment can link and i have the strategic project and then they said okay you can do chabahar but who will come when you have got the secondary extremely onerous secondary sanction who is going to come nobody came nobody bid for your tender and chabahar withered away so a major strategic partnership but i think lost iranians are much too sophisticated to say to your face that you let us down but let us sit back and see our own conduct and see where we have gone and today you have seen for the last two years there is no serious foreign policy so i have no recommendations to make because you are no longer a serious country you are and this agenda at home you know every distinguished indian has said that india's greatness is connected with its university with its unity and the sister and its celebration of its pluralistic and multicultural you know heritage absent that there is no you will be in a constant state of conflict and you will become completely inward looking as a result and that is not the model that india had i pointed out to many students various times if you look at the heritage of india india has always been a connected uh, country a people connected people i said indian ocean is called indian ocean not because india existed india never existed but because indians were constantly moving back and forth for 4000 years the remains of harappa in uh, in oman 
There are remains from India in Bahrain. There are, they have found the presence of Indian mathematicians in Sumeria. We were there in, during the Egyptian civilization. And the same thing obtained in the eastern side. We are a connected people. Look at the old Silk Road. The old Silk Road was an Indian road. It went from Xi'an to Aleppo, to, to, to Antioch. But Indian merchants were all over Central Asia. Every part of India was linked to the old Silk Road. Indian silks found their way to Rome. So anyway, also today we have, while we are all students of foreign affairs, and we wish our country well, there used to be a time when we used to be actively involved in giving writing papers, writing articles, which had an India-centric role, that India could do this, India could do that. We would attend meetings and say India could do Today, all of that is gone. I myself, who used to be so actively promoting India's role in bringing peace to West Asia, I, I, I would be ridiculed, I would be laughed out of the, out of the room. Think, what are you talking about? India doesn't even know where these countries are located. So, and you know, the revamping of the idea of India to suit a certain political agenda, we are going to seriously dive. It could be reversed and it will be reversed at some stage. But the point is, look at the damage it will leave behind and the time lost. Mr. Pasha spoke about, Dr. Pasha spoke about the pandemic. Look at the pandemic, how it has wreaked havoc. The main interest over here appears to be to cover up. You know, it is one of the most abysmal handling of one of the greatest tragedies that we have faced in recent times. But it's for as far as the people in power are concerned, it is a media challenge, not a health challenge, not an economic challenge, not a social challenge. It's how to manipulate the media and project a positive image. If that is the way we are going to go, then I think we have a very, very bleak future. And the world is not waiting. I pointed out this business of Eurasia. Russia and China have been working on it for the last five years. Systematically engaging with countries. Going there, discussing things, seeing what you can do with each other. This, When you have an agreement, it's a result of many years of effort, diplomatic effort. Bringing in your top people at the right time, the foreign minister Lavrov, Putin, these are people who are all over the place. So let me stop here. It's a litany of dissatisfaction and deep unhappiness. Uh, but uh, there we are, and we have to say it, and the people of my age and uh, background don't say this, and I don't know who else is going to say it. Nobody in the media is saying any of this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, for sharing your uh, views and definitely we, we need to be more proactive and uh, let us hope for the best. That's what uh, I could say. So thank you. And uh, I now come to the end of this very, very seamless, enriching, um, in fact, uh, comprehensive as uh, you just pointed out and very candid uh, discussion on recent developments in West Asia implications for um, India. So on behalf of, um, I would like to formally propose the vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies. I thank our speaker, uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad for delivering this distinguished lecture. We really uh, learned a lot uh, from you, sir, and our eminent uh, professor, Professor uh, Abdul Kamal Pasha, Aftab Kamal Pasha, sorry. And, uh, uh, your views, sir, uh, it was so important that uh, it has further intensified the need to, uh, to study, study the whole uh, region so, so passionately. And uh, our uh, attendees here watching us on, um, on uh, Zoom and also on Facebook Live, we have really learned a lot. And uh, in fact, we couldn't have asked for more with such distinguished speakers speaking today on the area that they really specialize on. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone who would be watching this program later on uh, YouTube and also listening to this on our different podcasts. So thank you so much for your time. And we are really grateful to both our speakers, Ambassador Ahmed and Professor Pasha.
So wish you all a very good evening and good night. Please take care of yourselves. Thank you, sir.